Hello there everyone, welcome, welcome back to the Max Jenker Show. Today I am joined with Dorothy Johnson, a breakup coach who helps people get over their ex, forgive and let go so they can stop obsessing over them and start creating the kind of life that they want, a better life post-breakup. And these are exactly going to be the same topics we're going to discuss on today's pod. It's going to be all about breakup recovery, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. First question, we're going to start with a softball. Why, Dorothy, why breakup advice? Why did you pick this field? When did you get into it? Because it's hyper-competitive. There's a lot of really nasty people in here. Uh, It's very saturated at the moment. I'm curious, what the hell is going on there? Uh, That's so funny. I don't know that it's saturated. So that's really interesting. That's a funny um, idea. So I actually went through a very traumatic breakup in 2016 um, that really put me on a different trajectory in life. So I had been dating this guy for about seven years. Um, he, We had moved back to Florida together from grad school and dental school. And it kind of felt like we were like really starting our life. I was finally like, oh my gosh, we're going to finally get engaged. We can like settle down and have babies. We got our house together, all of the things. And I was away in Chicago on a business trip and he broke up with me on the phone. And so it was seemingly out of the blue for me at the time. And I just remember being like completely rock bottom devastated, just so upset. I genuinely thought we were spending the rest of our life together, all of that, right? Well, Hmm. I'm pretty stubborn. So I got an apartment in Chicago, like immediately following the breakup. I got an apartment on my own. I moved in with my suitcase and I waited until he was gone from the house to go pick up my things. And so when I, about a month later, I flew down to Florida to grab my things from the house and he had had another girl staying there since I had left. So not only was I like super devastated and, you know, sad going through the loss, the grief, all of that. I was also very angry and resentful about this new girl seemingly having like come in and like swooped in and just took my spot is really how it kind of felt. So I, in that moment, got really like committed and dedicated and determined with myself to figure out how do I keep the lifestyle that I had with him? Like I, it wasn't just about like getting over him. I very much wanted to, of course, get over him. But there was a there was a secondary component there of he was really a portal of possibility in my life. He showed me um, a lifestyle that I could have that I just didn't know. He showed me a family environment that I could have had that I I never had before that I really wanted. He showed me in a lot of ways life was like really great. And I wanted to keep that no matter what. And I wanted to keep that even if he was no longer in my life. Um, so as any millennial would do, I went straight to Google and I was Googling how to get over your ex, how to, how to forgive and move on, how to let go when your ex moved on quickly. I was Googling all the things, but not only was I Googling it and reading it, I was doing all of it. So I was like traveling. I got in the best shape of my life. I was journaling, meditating, like doing everything that it said. But a year and a half later, I was still so angry and resentful about the situation. I didn't feel any differently. Like from the outside, I looked like I was thriving. Everyone's like, you're doing great. But internally, I'm like, I am dying inside. I like do not feel any differently uh, a year and a half later. And that's when I learned that thoughts create feelings. And the moment that I learned that thoughts create feelings, which was kind of mind blowing for me at the moment because I had graduated with a master's in psychology, like mm-hmm. studied psychology. My dad's a psychologist. Never once did anyone just like blatantly state that thoughts create feelings for me in the way that I was taught through the life coach school. And so it was just so interesting when I I learned that all of a sudden I started like putting everything together of like everyone's telling me it just takes time to heal. And that's just bullshit. It doesn't matter how much time goes by. If you don't change the thoughts in your head, you're not going to change the way that you feel. Secondly, I started realizing that desire and attachment were at the root of almost every breakup symptom I had been experiencing. Um, And so I was like, the key really is to figure out how to reduce desire and attachment. 
And both of those are drivers of addiction. Like, no wonder I felt addicted to my ex in a sense. I was I was participating in these behaviors that just didn't seem like me because we have desire for an attachment to our exes. And so I learned how to reduce desire and attachment through thought work. Um, and that's when I, I mean, I just organically started having people reach out asking, what did I do? How did I do it? They wanted help with their divorce. They wanted help with their breakup. And I was like, this is really something that's a need. Like there's no one else. When I started back in 2019, 2018, no one else was really doing this. This wasn't something that was... Um, I remember telling people I was a breakup coach. Number one, they didn't know what that was. They still don't when I tell them that. Um, and... <laughs> And I had a lot of people be like, what are you doing? That's insane. Like you have a master's degree in psychology. You have an amazing data analytics position. What are you doing? Like I, even my dad was like, I, I don't know why you're doing this. But it just felt like that is my calling. I feel very called to do this in the world. I know there's a better way to heal heartbreak. It shouldn't take someone a year and a half like it took me. Um, and it's very straightforward and simple. It is not overcomplicated, and everything on the internet is talking about breakup symptoms and overcomplicating the the, the process. So it just felt like my mission that to like go out and share with the world this very simple, easy process of not only getting over someone but also building a life that's bigger and better than the one that you had with your ex. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's kind of funny. Also, I also got into my breakup at 2016. I started my business around 2018, 19. <laughs> so, That's yeah. so fun. And the reaction I got from people is the same. Like my dad specifically, mm -hmm. big shot entrepreneur, like had no idea. You can even make money through this medium, through this, I guess, profession. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of the same, same sentiments, a lot of the same comments and thoughts yeah. from the people around me. So funny, isn't it wild? But when you knew, you just knew. Uh, honestly, no. Honestly, it was a it was a discovery period for me personally. Mm. I first started out. For, the first goal was just to make money. After my br devastating breakup, I was broke and everything because I spent all the cash on different breakup recovery programs from other mm. experts. And then I slowly and slowly honed in on this niche. At first, I started as a dating coach for men. Then I started as someone helping people uh, turn around a toxic relationship. Then I slowly pivoted yet again to just helping people get over a breakup. And now I specifically talk about just all self-improvement advice, yeah. but tailored for people going through a breakup. It was a, this a long discovery phase that probably lasted more than a year before wow. I really like knew my quote unquote call in what I basically feel really passionate about and feel that I can provide some genuine value here. Yeah, yeah it just wasn't like, you know, as quick, maybe as that's in, in your case. Yeah. Yeah. For me it was just very clear. I was like Oh, that's, that's I don't really lucky. I didn't know yeah, I didn't really know about coaching, but like I knew that it was clear I was meant to help the world with heartbreak in a completely different mm. way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's really awesome. I kind of had maybe a similar thing. I knew it wasn't so altruistic, though. I knew from a very young age, 17 and onwards, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be an author, a blogger, and I wanted to write self-help in general. And yeah. the whole breakup thing, that was actually just a way to monetize um, mm -hmm. the self-help work because the genre is just very saturated. If I was just another self-help author, right, I would never build an audience. But if I was mm -hmm. the self-help author for people going for a breakup, now we're talking about possible monetization and making a living from this. Niching, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. basically niching down in our lingo. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Tell, tell me this, if I was, let's say, going for a breakup, if you got a client who's going for a breakup, generic breakup, wife, boyfriend, whatever, girlfriend, they've left them, they've been dumped, now they're, let's say, a week in the whole shit show, in your opinion, based on what you gather from your clients, what would be some, like, first steps 
a person could, could take to combat some of that heartbreak, not to fix everything, not to get over the person completely all of a sudden, just to get some, I guess, stability, emotional, routine-like in their life. Any ideas? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so it's fascinating because I think the first, the very first thing that I believe is super helpful when it comes to healing after a devastating heartbreak, whether you're the person who left or whether you're the person who did the leaving, is making sure that your nervous system is regulated. I think it's a step that can be overlooked, especially because, especially by me. I like actually very much love the thought work part of it, the mind work of it. I love looking at like, what are you making this breakup mean about you? Because that's like the optional suffering part. But the very first step is really making sure that your body is safe, your body is uh, regulated, doing cranial sacral work, doing, you know, Reiki, anything that really helps your body get grounded and your nervous system regulated so that you're not in a fight or flight situation. We can't what? really like... L Sorry to cut you off. Just let's yeah. backtrack a little bit. What's Reiki and the, the thing you said before it? Oh yeah, cranial sacral. That. Yeah, sorry, yeah. cranial sacral and Reiki. It's like energetic body work. It is okay. work to again calm your nervous system. It's very similar to yoga or massage oh, or okay. Thai massage, like anything that's getting your body connected to a calming state. I don't know if you've ever. I'm sure you've found yourself in a fight or flight state at times where your mind is racing. You can't really organize your mind, and it's typically because your body feels just very heightened and in a heightened state. Mm -hmm. um, and so when your body's in that heightened state, which a lot of times when clients are immediately coming out of a breakup, some I, and I say a lot of times, it's not all the time, right? Like sometimes you're coming out of the breakup and you've done a lot of this work before you even left the situation. But um, a lot of times you're in this fight or flight state, you're graspy, you're worried about the rest of your life, you're fearful about your future. You're, you've spiraled so much that your body can't even like sit still or rest and it feels all consuming and completely debilitating. Um, so the very first step is getting your body to a place where it can rest, where it can feel calm, where it can feel safe enough to even just start exploring like, okay, the grief is here. The grief is a part of this. That's the part that's not optional. That's the required part is going moving through grief, moving through loss, sadness, devastation. But the suffering part is the part around like, what am I making this breakup mean about me? What am I making it mean about the relationship? Because if I'm making it mean all these negative things about myself, that's the part that's really not required. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go through that whole turmoil or that story. We can mute that part. Um, and then when you're able to like, when you're calm enough, then that's when you're able to start looking at the thoughts also that are creating desire and attachment and start working on reducing desire and attachment in a way that you probably never intentionally done before you've done it unintentionally but never intentionally got it got it could you actually just personally curious about this how do you do this intentionally can you give me like one yeah. maybe example so i love using ice cream examples with a lot of my okay. uh heartbreak uh stories so when you think about ice cream, ice cream used to be my favorite food. And the way that I talk about ice cream, I can talk about it in two different ways. One makes it really desirable and one makes it less desirable. So the first way is, hey, oh my gosh, Max, have you heard of ice cream? It's really fucking good. It is so good. It melts in your mouth. It's ooey gooey. It's caramely. Have you tried the chocolatey chunks? They're so good. It's like literally my favorite food. I'm absolutely obsessed. You are naturally gaining desire for something because of the way that I'm talking about it, because of the way that I'm describing it. If I approached you in a different way and I said, Max, oh my God, have you heard of this thing called ice cream? It's just sugar and milk mixed together. Mm. Both of those are equally true. One creates desire and one reduces desire. And neither of those are good or bad, right? Like neither, like when you're in a relationship, you want to increase desire. You want to have desire for your partner. But when you are going through a breakup and you no longer either want to be in the relationship anymore or you're, the other person doesn't want to be in a relationship with you, we need to reduce that desire. And it's not 
it's not we're out, not out there like making out your ex to be this bad person. We're just looking at the whole picture. I'm not making ice cream be this bad thing. I'm just looking at the whole picture. It's like it's really just sugar and milk and it gives me a sugar high and I can't sleep before bed when I eat it before bed. Right? And so we're we're looking at the whole picture, the whole truth instead of just, you know, romanticized parts of the truth. Got it. Now, what do you think are some of the really common mistakes you see clients and customers and perhaps listeners to your podcast make when it comes to detachment, when it comes to, in general, healing from a breakup, anything they should watch out for when they're going through a breakup? You know, Max, I think a lot of it comes down to like just the first couple of steps. Like, I think a lot of people are afraid to even get over their ex. Like, I know, I just know so many people, including myself, that you know, (laughs) you don't even want to get over your ex. You just want your ex back or you want your ex to do better. So it's like hard to even decide to get over your ex and then commit to that decision and practice it because you're like, well, Dor, I just really want him back. I just want him to do better. Like, I don't really want to get over this person. I don't want to reduce desire and attachment. I just want this person to show the fuck up and like do better and change. (laughs) Right. And so, um, The thing that I tell people when it comes to that is like learning that getting over your ex is really about two different things. In my mind, getting over your ex is learning how to be emotionally mature, learning to not be at the effect of your ex, learning how to feel neutral and indifferent if you have to be in front of your ex, whether that's co-parenting, working together, whatever, but not being at the effect emotionally of this person. And then the second one is learning, again, detachment, non-attachment of you know, everything I want in my life can be created regardless of whether or not he's he or she is in my relationship, right? Like, whatever I want in my life, it it's not, I can go out and create it no matter who's in my life. Yeah. And when you've accomplished those two things, in my mind, you've accomplished getting over that person. So we don't have to wait to see if the ex comes back. Like, do those two things. Your ex might come back. I, I'm not someone who's going to sit here and say you can never get back together with your ex. It absolutely happens. And those relationships can work. But if you don't do that work, if you don't learn how to get over your ex, if you don't learn how to reduce desire and attachment, when that person comes back, Mm -hmm. you it, it can feel uneven, it can feel unequal, and you're terrified of that person leaving again. You're just having the same relationship over again. And we want your next relationship to be different, whether that's with your ex or somebody new. Um, so I would say that's the first one that I notice. The second one is around desire and attachment still, where Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we believe that, oh, if I reduce desire for my ex, that means I have to reduce desire for everything that I want. That's not the case at all. We're not reducing desire for the dream, right? Like the dream is, I want a partnership. I want a healthy partnership. I want to have a family. I want to find my person. We're not reducing desire for that. We are reducing desire for a very specific how, right? Which is your ex. Thinking that that is the person that's going to get you the dream. Does that make sense? You've got to have the different. It has to be different. It actually explains why this eggs back niche is so damn popular. Like, Mm. fun fact, yet again, 80% of my income, and this is despite me pivoting hard the past year into breakup recovery advice, 80% of my income is tied to people who buy eggs back stuff from me. Even though I tell them, you probably ain't gonna rekindle it, the odds are against your favor, even though I conducted an entire survey of like 4,000 plus people that proved that rarely anyone gets back together with an ex, at least for good, people still eat that shit up. And yeah, Mm -hmm. your explanation, especially the first one, really makes it clear why that is. Yeah. Have you you got maybe even clients who at the end want breakup advice, but then uh, you maybe realize that, hey, they actually want their ex back. They don't want to get over them. A hundred percent. issues with that? 
I don't I haven't had any issues with it. I I think that I cater to it even like I talk about that. Like I feel like my the containers that I'm in, the way that I speak about it, it's a safe space to bring that because Mm -hmm. there's not a lot. I don't think there's a lot of safe spaces to bring that. It's either, hey, if you want your ex back, I'll help you figure out how to get your ex back. Or, hey, if you're getting over your breakup, you don't actually want your ex back. And here's what you need to do. I think I'm a middle ground where it's like, I understand that you want your ex back. I think we need to do this work regardless. I can't tell you if your ex is going to come back or not. That's not something like I have no way of predicting that. I'm not going to help you get your ex back. But here's what I am going to help you do is love your fucking life. I'm going to help you build a life that's bigger and better than the one that you had with your ex. So you're not actually Mm -hmm. constantly thinking about this person. Sometimes exes come back. That's absolutely true. But that's not something that has to happen for you to love your life. And so I I definitely work with people who start out with, I don't like, I want to move through this stuff and I want to do it for altruistic reasons. But my truthful reason is I just want my ex back and I'm hoping like maybe this will get me there. I allow them to say that. I allow them to be in that place. And I don't think there's a lot of containers that do that. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Especially if you've seen Reddit, uh, the posts there. Like, Jesus, mm-hmm. you get so much, so shamed for wanting an ex bag there. Yeah. yeah. Reddit's scary. That's like the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Especially when it comes to breakup advice. And these coaches are scammers and these owners are pieces of shit. Yeah, don't, don't go there. <laughs> don't try to promote your stuff there. I've been burned. I've been promoting yeah. my articles years ago there. And I got eaten alive. I've been, I literally got <laughs> messages that I should kill myself. Oh. <gasps> Oh my God! No, (laughs) really. There are some don't do that. Sick people there, but but I I kind of get it. They're going for a breakup. You really, even though the content is helpful, you are still promoting there your stuff, and uh, some people just aren't receptive to that. However, Mm -hmm. you make the promotion look like I guess. But anyway, what do you think are some? Some underrated pieces of breakup advice in this case that you think more experts, coaches in our space should talk about. Underrated pieces of breakup advice. Yeah, something you rarely see talk about that's actually really powerful that should be talked more about. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, I feel like time has nothing to do with healing. I hate that saying. I hate the saying. Like, it just takes time. Um... I'm like, no, it really doesn't. Getting over your ex can happen in a moment. It really does happen in a moment. It's like a shift. It's like a click, like Mm -hmm. a click. And so in my mind, it doesn't take time. It takes practice, right? Like thinking about if I were to pick up tennis or pickleball, (laughs) since that's really popular now, it's like if I were to go pick that up, it doesn't really matter like timing wise. Like it's not oh, you know, Dorothy's been practicing this for six months. It's Dorothy has been practicing this five days a week for six months versus Dorothy's been practicing this for six months, only two days a week, right? Like it's practice and repetition over time. Um, And so that's one of the pieces where I'm just like, it doesn't, time isn't it. It's really truthfully about desire and attachment, reducing those two things. Something that is actually really fascinating that's kind of been brand new in my world lately is I went and got a certified, uh, an advanced certification in grief. And I also personally went through a miscarriage in November of 2022. And as I was going through this miscarriage, you know, I'm scouring the internet kind of it was a very similar experience of like getting over an ex of like scouring the internet of like, what can I do to get over this miscarriage? And like, I was bombarded with these communities and with these like platforms and these pieces of advice of uh, everyone kept saying like, this isn't something that you get over. And I was max, I was just seething inside, like coming from the world of like, get over your ex in three months or less. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just want like a duplicate of me who has done this with miscarriage. Like, how do I get over my miscarriage in three months or less? And I couldn't find it. And it, and it was talking about how you how this is something you don't get over. Well, simultaneously, I'm going through this advanced grief certification. And I started to realize like the reason people are saying that is like 
we're, we're bulking grief and getting over something in the same bucket. But what if we started separating that? Like, what if we started actually looking at grief separately than getting over someone? Because grief is something that's intertwined in your life. It's integrated in your life. That's something that pops up all the time that doesn't necessarily go away. Like, I don't think someone heals their grief and never experiences it again. That's why we have mm-hmm. secondary loss. And so that's when I realized I was like, oh, my gosh, I can get over this miscarriage just like my people get over their ex and grief is separate. And so that's something that I feel like hasn't really been talked about a lot lately of like from other people of how is grief separate from getting over your ex versus, you know, grief is definitely a a part of the process. You're like, you've got to move through your grief to get over your ex. But that doesn't mean you'll never experience secondary loss, which is a form of grief, ever again. And that's what I notice for people going through breakups is you might be over your ex in terms of you've got zero desire for your ex. You've got zero attachment for your ex. You set your quantitative ways of measuring over your ex, whether that's like you don't think about your ex as often, all that. And you've accomplished all that. You've done that. But then you go to your kid's graduation and your hus- your ex-husband is there with their new partner and you experience, you know, a secondary loss of this was going to look different. That's grief. That's secondary loss. This was going to look different. It doesn't mean you're not over this person. It doesn't mean you want them back. But that's okay that you're experiencing that secondary loss. And I think that that's been something that's been fascinating to me mm-hmm. recently that isn't talked about <clears throat> a lot. So I think you actually have a point here because I... I've kept my thumb on the pulse of this industry for a long time, and this is something that I also see very much neglected. Maybe someone like David Kessler, the author of The Sixth uh, Stage of Grief, talks about it a bit. Craig Kenneth, another brilliant breakup coach, talks about it a little bit as well. And yeah, I definitely do agree with you here that this is something that should be talked more about instead of the usual which is, well, that's actually my next question, the no contact rule. What do you mm-hmm. think? You have a really interesting episode on this podcast episode on the uh, no contact rule that you never heard of or something like that, I think. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, what's your take on no contact? How should it work in your opinion? Because every fucking breakup coach has their own take, myself yeah. included, on this thing. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't think no con. I think, again... Like I talked about before, it just it feels like there's a lot of um, solutions for breakup symptoms rather than just addressing the root cause, which is the desire and the attachment piece. Right. And so when it comes to no contact, what's so fascinating is I again, when I first started my journey as a breakup coach, there were just so many people preaching the no contact rule. And it just I was like, why? There's so many people who have gone no contact that I know that are not over their ex. There's people who can't go no contact, people need, who need to co-parent, they work together, they have social circles together. And not that they they could, absolutely, but like, do they want to? And I'm like, I would rather just get to the place where I feel indifferent and neutral around my ex instead of just like trying to manipulate the world around me and try to like walk on eggshells and try to, I, I don't know, it just seemed, again, very symptom-based solution. So- mm-hmm. In my mind, again, reducing desire and attachment, when you have no desire for someone and you have no attachment to having them in your future, if you see them at a party, you see them in your social circle, it's not a problem. You're co-parenting with them, not a problem. Like, it's mm-hmm. just, I would rather solve for the the root cause and the root problem versus, you know, working with the symptoms. Now, with that being said, I know that no contact does help people change their thoughts by not having any interaction with that person. But eventually you're going to have to do that work at some point. So it's just like, when when do you want to do that work? Got it. So it sounds like you should, you should not make no contact the main thing as most coaches and experts uh, recommend. It should be something that yeah. I guess should help you get over your ex simultaneously while you're also trying out other methods yeah mm-hmm. fair enough fair enough and of course what's yeah, your viewpoint on it very similar to yours honestly 
uh, uh, my viewpoint is, well, it really depends. For example, getting an eggs back versus breakup recovery. In both cases, I say limit contact as much as possible for as long as possible. Not really adhering to the whole 60, 30 day period or whatever. Uh, I really try to encourage people to do this indefinitely. And I also make a note to point out the caveat, hey, if you need to co-parent, if there is some work project involved, if you have a dog together or something, a pet together, obviously you should talk about those things. That's you. It's not like you should completely ignore and cut your act out of your life. But if that is possible, if you can cut them out of your life, because I am mainly talking to people, uh, to probably younger people than in your audience based on your testimonials. I usually talk to like people around their 30s. And mm -hmm. in those cases, most of the time, yeah, you can just cut contact completely. And that's something I recommend. But of course, mm -hmm. it's not the main thing. It's not the miracle solution that everyone um, I guess, tries to make you believe. It's just yeah. part of a larger story. Right, 100%. So that's and kind it's of like similar when, to yours, right? Your philosophy on this. 100%, yeah. And it's just, it, it, like when I notice people hung up on like, well, should I go no contact? Should I not go? I'm just like, literally, we are solving for the wrong problem. Like, let me ask you these other questions. And then it's going to make this decision so much clearer, right? Yeah. Have you ever came across a client that was incredibly lonely and felt isolated. And I'm curious, how did you, you probably have, and how did you handle clients like that? Yeah, you know, I'm talking about the people who just, maybe they don't have any close family, any close relatives. Maybe don't they don't have a good social circle in terms of quantity as well as perhaps quality. And I'm curious, does that kind of a person, should they meet new friends? Should they go date? Uh, even perhaps, even though they're trying to get over an ex, what would you say is the best course of action for those kind of people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 100%. Most, of, I would say almost everyone, even when they have like a close circle and even when they're surrounded by people, a lot of times following a breakup, you feel lonely. Um, it, you can be in a crowd of people and feel lonely, right? So I think you know, when I work with my clients, it's in a group container. So that's just automatically taken care of when they join the group container because they're mm -hmm. surrounded by other individuals who are doing this work, going through a lot of the same things, can celebrate like the first day of not thinking about this person, all of this stuff. But if they don't have that, it's absolutely get out there and start making friends. Like, even if you're not an extroverted person, I'm a very introverted person. And I, but I also am very, um, picky about who I surround myself with. And I don't have large group of friends. I have deep friendships and far, like just fewer deep friendships versus like mm -hmm. broad, lots of surface level friendships. So, um, I mean, there's so many ways you can do that, right? Like meet up, um, all these different events. If you're in like a nice big city, if you're not, right, that's a little bit more difficult. And you, maybe you perhaps turn to communities online in some way, shape or form. However, as I say that, Max, I'm very like the communities online can be interesting because when I thought, you know, I'm going through my miscarriage, I didn't have anybody physically around me that I felt I could speak to that knew what I was going through. So I turned to online <clears throat> communities and a lot of the communities I found myself in were extraordinarily discouraging and I didn't like hanging out in them. And I, the, I didn't like the belief patterns that they had or the perspectives they had. So if you do turn to online, make sure it feels good. Make sure you find communities that feel good and feel uplifting and feel like they're helping you instead of just allowing you to like wall up. I, I actually have a hot take here. Do you want to hear it? Yes, tell me your hot take, Max. Buy community access. Forget the yeah. community. It's like, I, I, look, I take this with a grain of salt. With all my courses, with all my products, there is also a community. But what I saw is that when you actually pay for a community, there's filtration involved. There's moderation. My community, for the most part, 99% of the time, it's really positive, really uplifting. Most people have these similar worldviews and beliefs there. 
and we get along because I filter the kind of people who buy my products because only certain people come to my website and because I'm there every fucking day answering questions and talking to people and having like group calls and yeah. everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So people <laughs> pay for the community. If you want the best, the best experience, you should pay for one. And I don't care if this is from like Dorothy, from me, any breakup coach, any professional. I think that really um, is valuable because there's just so much moderation involved and filtration. Dorothy, what do you think? Max, you're so smart. Absolutely. I totally agree. Totally agree. Honestly, though, I have seen I've seen it. I've seen the free communities. I've I've been in paid communities um, and, and you do see a, a significant difference. And I just think I think what gets in the way sometimes I've I've heard this from people once in a while. I don't know if you've heard this from, mm-hmm. but we shouldn't have to pay for communities. We shouldn't have to. And it's like I get to and I want to because I want a curated community. I want a curated community of high yeah. quality, up leveled individuals who are really going after it. I don't want to have to spend hours weeding through like junk. <laughs> exactly. And for the skeptical listeners out there. That's kind of the role of us content creators. Maybe, okay, fair enough. You're more of a coach. I don't qualify myself as a coach at all, just like a writer, content creator. But the point is, us content creators, the real value you get when you buy our products and support our work, apart from supporting our work, which is fucking great, you get moderation. You get handpicked pieces of content and media and stuff like that that would be a pain in the ass to pick out yourself from all the free materials out there. So yeah, (gasps) just another quick point. I have a really great example of that, Max. This is so cool. Cool. Yeah, so it's not breakup related, but it just, it reminded me of this when you said that hand-picked and like curated. Um, So I follow, I follow lots of people, right? But long story short, I want to learn more about photography and like branding and I'm trying to figure out like how do I take B-roll footage? Oh my God, Max, I'm so bad at it. So bad at it. So, and of course, I can go to the YouTube, right? I could go to YouTube. I could Google. I could easily just be like, tell me all the things and like sift through all of the internet information, find the best pieces and like whatever. But instead, I was I found and I stumbled across a $99 course by someone who puts it all in order. It's like one minute videos for each little thing. And like to me, that is so worth it, right? I'm like, it's a done deal. I would have paid $500 for that course. Like just give me everything, like the things that I need in bite-sized increments in the order that I need them to get this job done. And that is just the difference, I think, between you, like what you're saying of like just free content versus curated content. Exactly, because I get always the argument, like why are you charging for certain pieces of content and everything? Because curation, apart from making a living, yeah. and the value is also, and the people ask me like, hey, where's the value? I can find probably the same things you teach online. And I'm like, good luck, buddy. Yeah, you can definitely do that. What you're really paying me for is the curation and the structure. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Love it. Cool, cool. Well, um, a few minutes ago, you talked about friendship, talked about no contact when let's say um, you still have pets, kids involved, stuff like that, when you kind of need to be at least friendly with your ex. What about friendship, like actual friendship, like hanging out as friends, going on like a coffee meetup, for example? Is this something you're for? Is this something something you're against? Is this something that it kind of depends on the person and on the situation? What do you think? Yeah, I'm definitely someone who it depends on the person in the situation. Like myself personally, I'm just not friends with any of my exes. It's just not, mm-hmm. I don't need to be. I'm not physically in a location near them. I didn't have similar friend groups. We had very clear separated friend groups. Um, I just personally don't, but I have I have so many clients who have become friends with their ex, especially in, I see it a lot in co-parenting situations where mm-hmm. – um, they they have to co-parent and then but they become such close friends and like really great parents together and then they both have new partners and they go off and they do these things together and they make such a beautiful family environment for the children um that it's really neat so i've seen both work i know that both can work um it really is just a personal preference now 
that's I also don't think it's a decision you need to make until you're over your ex. So like wait till you get over your ex and then decide is a friendship something that's required or necessary or something I desire still. Because if you're not over your ex and you're trying to make that decision, it's going to be influenced and swayed by your desire and attachment for that person. Got it. What about dating? When should a person date, in your opinion, after a breakup? Immediately when it feels fun and exciting? Uh, after a certain period of days, I guess, has passed. What do you think? That's it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that I think is helpful is having an intention for your dating. Like, mm. everyone's intention is going to be a little bit different. If your intention for dating is to find your, the next, like, love of your life, to get married, to, like, be serious with someone, I would strongly suggest being over your ex first, right? Having zero desire, zero attachment, or else you're going to find yourself comparing yourself to your ex, or not yourself, mm -hmm. but the new partner to the ex. Um, if your intention is just to get out there, have fun, connect, meet new people, um, that that is a different kind of experience. And you get to make the call of, do I want to get completely over my ex before I do that? I I strongly suggest it. But again, I've seen all of it, right? Got it. Got it. Fair enough. So it basically depends whether I want to date casually, whether I want a committed partner, friends with benefits, something in between. Yeah, right. And because I think a lot of times when you're going through a breakup, you're really missing connection. And then there's the whole intimacy piece, which is like a whole that's a completely new whole podcast episode, right? Of like, how do we create intimacy when we're going through a breakup when we're still so devastated and upset? Um and so you really have to be clear about your intention around dating, and then you have to set your own parameters. And like, I, of course, can give you my ideas and my perspective around parameters based off of previous clients. Mm -hmm. And the most basic of basics is like, get over your ex first, and then let's start talking about dating. And getting over your ex is feeling confident in your ability to go out and create this bigger and better life, which includes believing that there are people out there that are more aligned for you than your ex and most of the time if you haven't done that work it's hard to date because you just it ends up leading to you thinking about that person more often thinking about the ex more often because you're like oh my gosh no one's ever going to be as good as him or her yeah you know what i actually uh totally thought of of in another question um from the top of my head because this is an interesting topic that you brought up what about friends with benef benefits most of the time, from what I gathered, people who want to be friends with benefits, uh, with their ex specifically, they kind of low-key want them back. And it's usually a very mani manipulative tactic or they just don't really know that they're being manipulative. They're just looking for a back door back to a, I guess, a rekindled relationship. But what do you think about being friends with benefits with an ex? Is this something that I also should first get over the uh, the other person and then think about being friends with benefits. Is this something you should, from the get-go, post-breakup, go into it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, my, my standard, <laughs> like the word that I want to use, my standard care of advice, Max, is really like be the version of you who's over your ex. Like literally be that person. Mm -hmm. And think about how that version of you makes the decision. Because by the time you get over your ex, the likelihood of wanting to be friend, like friends with benefits with your ex is probably pretty low because you've reduced all desire and all attachment for this person. I think you'd prefer to go out and find someone better to sleep with, to be quite honest. And so mm -hmm. I just I don't even think that that would be the case. And so 100 percent, I'm like definitely get over your ex and then just like make that decision then decide on something like that um it seems like you're kind but, of hoping that they don't decide that specific path well yes i mean it, my yeah. honest transparent i'm like it just seems messy right like again when i think about just like the basics of um the basics of thought work even max is mm -hmm. If you want a certain result in your life, if you want to if you want to be a millionaire, you've got to start acting like a millionaire. And to do that, you've got to start feeling like a millionaire. And to start feeling like a millionaire, you need to start thinking like one. Mm -hmm. So the same goes for getting over your ex. If you want to be someone who's over your ex, you've got to start acting like her. You've got to start feeling like that version. And you've got to start thinking like that person. You've got to think about yourself 
Mm. in a different regard than you are now. And I just don't believe that those two things match up. Does that make sense? Got it. Oh, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Also, <laughs> kind of, uh, it, it's fun to hear that you have this uh, hidden intention that's the same on my side, especially when it comes to just getting an eggs back. Because uh, I always also say, before you try to get your eggs back, quote-unquote, be sure to at least, to a large degree, get over them. And my secret hope there is that the person will get over them and with that lose their attachment for them completely and as well as their desire to get back together in the first place. So yeah, mm. I think we're pretty aligned yeah. on that. Yeah. But that yeah. actually brings me to my last question. This is kind of a selfish one. What's <laughs> next for Dorothy Johnson? Are we talking speaking? Are we talking books? Right now you have a podcast. You have a lovely course. Um, do you, any, any plans you're willing to share regarding your brand, where it's going to go in the next few years? Yeah, that's a really great question, Max. That's a really great question. Like you and me both, I want to know. <laughs> like, I I am personally, I'm just going to be really honest and transparent. I wish, I wish I could come to you and be like, Max, these are the plans. This is what we've got. You know, these are all our ideas. I am very much in, um, in a transition stage, I'd say, where I've got my signature programs, my signature courses. They feel good. Um, I have started a new mastermind called the Bigger and Better Life Mastermind, which has been super fun. And that's really honed in on like the the individuals who've already gotten over their ex. What does it look like to build their bigger and better life and really amplifying that? Um, but I, of course, definitely want to write books. I have a three part series like I have gone through a breakup where I was left. So I want to I want a book called How to Get Over Your Ex. Right. We want the how to how to do the breaking up because I've gone through a breakup where I did the breaking up and then how mm -hmm. to stay, like how to be in a relationship and stay in your relationship. Um, and so I definitely want a three-part book series that's probably not on the docket for like three or four years. Um, but that's definitely a part of what I want to be doing. We also opened up Heartbreak Hotel, which has been super fun. And that's like new-ish. I saw that. I, I yeah. showed that to my girlfriend. She was like, you can do that with your apartment in Florida. Yeah. That's that's genius. Yeah. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. And so it's been super fun. Heartbreak Hotel has been great. Um, I love curating, like, experiences for people and helping, like, use the coaching in combination with, like, the combined travel. Because I think – I'm sure you know this, too. It's like when you travel, it is easier to think differently about yourself and, and create new beliefs about yourself um, and get new perspectives from different cultures. And so I think the combination of travel plus coaching is, like, such a beautiful um, combination. And so that's been really fun. Um, but yeah, so that's, I'm still kind of just where I'm at right now and not trying to project too much into the future. Cool. Well, you're definitely Sorry that right. wasn't as exciting as you probably wanted it to be. <laughs> it was very relatable though. I'm also in the transition stage, a transitional pivotal stage, I guess, but in a different direction. I'm actually trying to be as passive as I can and mm -hmm. move from coaching to a fully content creation business and let yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to let that be the main thing and being very much a lot of uh, low ticket items instead of a high ticket one one high ticket program that I've done in the past and stuff like that yeah that's exciting congratulations that'll be fun yeah I, I think so too I think so too yeah cool well thanks for coming on Dorothy um, thanks for having free. me of course. Feel free to promote yourself at, uh, now. Like, where can people find you? Where can they learn more about you, your work, yada, yada, yada? Take yeah, it away. Yeah, definitely. So we've got the How to Get Over Your Ex podcast. Love the podcast. It's like the Netflix for breakups. There's short, powerful, impactful, to the point. We've got the problem with a solution, call to actions and next steps because I'm a next steps girly. Love it. Um, if you hang out on Instagram, I love hanging out over there at Breakup Coach Dorothy. And then my website, if you want to see what's going on, is www.dorothyabjohnson.com. And yeah, I'm excited. Thank you so much, Max, for having me. This was such a fun conversation. So just one more thing before you take off. Go sign up for my newsletter if you'd like to stay in touch and learn more about my work the Breakthrough Letter. It's a weekly email with one idea, suggestion, and resource 
to help you break through your breakup and create a new possibility for love, be that with your ex or someone new. So go to maxjanker.com slash letters to join the newsletter. That's maxjanker.com slash letters, as in a letter you send to your grandma or something. And with that out of the way, thanks again for listening and bye-bye.